Okay, it's uh, Saturday the 27th of May, and I'm absolutely delighted to turn the tables on John Campbell, <laughs> the brilliant John Campbell, who has interviewed me several times, and I have got the opportunity now to interview him. And I'm actually joined also by the brilliant Jessica Rose, who will be contributing to the discussion. It's the first time that they've actually met, although they have communicated before. So Yeah, I bullied my way into the conversation, so I, I'm really grateful for being here. And nice to meet you, John. Finally. Nice to meet you too, Jessica. Okay, so John, most people yeah. um, watching this interview will actually know only know you since the COVID era, but you actually had a very big following on YouTube before that. Can you tell us about how you became such a successful YouTuber? Well, I actually started way back in about 1990, I think it was, Norman. And um, i had done some teaching trips overseas to poorer countries, uh, Cambodia and India, places, poorer areas in India. And um, I wanted to be able to teach there. But of course, I had a job at home. I had a family at home. So uh, we start, what we started doing was recording lectures. Now, Norman, I happen to know you're old enough to remember these. Jessica's mum will tell her about them later. <laughs> but uh, we recorded on these things. and. Uh, at the time it was quite a revolution we could record we could we could uh make copies and send them to three or four different countries and and and, and that was great and the feedback was actually pretty good and then as time went on we went on to these nice shiny things we went on to dvds and we put lectures on uh onto onto dvds but then of course uh things became completely uh to use that appalling phrase dematerialized <laughs> and uh i actually went on to youtube uh, my, my techie at work said, John, it'd be a good idea if you went on to uh, YouTube. I said, well, what's that? This was 2007. Actually, I'd heard of it, but I didn't know anything about it. So we started uploading views. And then to our surprise, we got thousands of views uh, in the first week, just uploading um, basic lessons. So, you know, what you might call talk and chalk, you know, me with my felt pen and a whiteboard and drawing a picture of the heart or the lungs or, or whatever it was. And that picked up quite a bit. I think we were up to about 100,000 uh, subscribers in uh, 2019. So it was going reasonably well, virtually entirely being watched by student nurses, medical students, uh, quite a few vet students, pharmacy students, mo mostly sort of aim aimed at uh, junior professionals learning the basics, the anatomy, the physiology the pathophysiology, the pharmacology that all nurses and doctors should uh, should know about. And then COVID came along, of course. Now, the first COVID video I did was, uh, I'm pretty sure it was the 26th of January 2020. And I remember waking up in the morning and saying, uh, well, I'll see how that video is done. And it had loads of views. I thought, heck, it's got loads of views. And that was just on like the basic science around coronaviruses, which, to tell you the truth, I had to swat up. I had to, to, to look that up. Uh, and then it, it built up really quite dramatically from, from there uh, throughout 2020, of course, and 2021, which were the pandemic years. So that's kind of the uh, the history of it, Norman, yeah. So you've now got 2.8 million YouTube followers then, I think something like that, yeah? Yeah, I think it's, yeah, I think it's getting up to that area now, yeah, 2.7, 2 2.8. OK, so that's it's a pity they don't all watch Norman. If they all watched every video, uh, we'll be doing quite well. Yeah, <laughs> unfortunately, they don't. I think a lot of people subscribe and then forget about me. But hey, that's OK. I'm not I'm not complaining about it. But you but you do typically get like hundreds of thousands of views for each video. No, it varies quite a bit. I mean, I mean you get the odd video or get a million views. Quite a few get or get half a million. Um, but then um, others will get you know, significantly less than that. It depends yeah, the, on the, the, the... The ones that get less are usually the ones with me in it, I've noticed, actually. <laughs> uh, I wasn't going to mention that, Norman. Um, <laughs> but, 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 but you lend the channel great gravitas, so I'm grateful, seriously. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, okay. No, typically, but... typically, the interviews do get less. Right, OK. Um, you know, even if I'm interviewing someone good-looking like a Seymour Hotra, um, you know, we'll get we'll get less views than typically. Um, that, that that you've got to get Jessica on then as a as a, as a <laughs> yeah, interviewee. Yeah. 
Yeah, but there again, some some interviews get 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 re really good views, and and of course, one of the things to be completely serious that we do interview is is people that have suffered various conditions who have been uh, noble enough um, to come on the channel and talk about their experiences. They often get you know fairly good views, and it's it's really good of some people to do that. And YouTube doesn't ban them, you know. YouTube censorship. And uh, general big tech censorship is a really difficult subject. As far as I can tell, it's based on uh, artificial intelligence. It's based on algorithms. And it's probably based on 16 things that I've never heard of. Um, so quite how they get to where they get to, I don't really know. But what YouTube are very good at is allowing personal experience. Okay. Um, so they are very open to that. And I commend YouTube for that, that if someone says, look, I'm not saying this is right. I'm not saying it's wrong. This is what happened to me. This is my experience. And uh, they do seem to respect that. So, so the views that these videos where people have been talking about the personal experience, I've been I've been OK. Yeah, well, that's interesting, because I know for a fact that um, Facebook bans those automatically takes those down. Yeah. Um, interesting. They, OK. They, yeah. Facebook, the censorship is quite bad. Uh, I've only been doing Twitter recently, but I believe it was quite bad on Twitter. You would know this better than me. Yeah, you, oh, yeah, you couldn't, you know, before Elon Musk took over. Mm. I mean, Jessica, you got, uh, you were suspended, weren't you? Yeah, I was uh, temporarily suspended, I think is the, the phrasing, um, twice. And then when I was sleeping one night, I was, uh, I got a, um, uh, kicked off permanently. I don't remember the word because I was uh, um, I was accused of ban evasion, and I I don't know what that is. So I had oh, to look oh, it up, and apparently ban evasion. So I was banned, and what they were claiming was that I tried to create another account to get around the fact that they were banning me on this other thing. And I'm I'm like, what? I was asleep, dudes. And so, like, either somebody was doing that and and they were posing as me or they just made it up. Either way, it was like the the reason why I was um, I was censored is because I was posting um, VAERS data from CDC, but I was posting it verbatim. Like I like quoted the symptom text file in, in somebody's VAERS ID. And it's like, if that can get you kicked off of a social media platform, I don't know what the hell is going on anymore because it's like, that's, that's a government database I'm quoting. If you're saying that that's misinformation, then you're calling a government database misinformation. And furthermore, what you guys were just talking about, this this trying to attempt to censor somebody's personal experience, no, 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 no. Like I have a huge problem with that. So I'm really glad to hear what you said about YouTube's attitude, like your perceived, um, I don't know much about YouTube anymore. I, I have a channel, but I don't really use it. But I'm glad to hear you say that because, um, you know, it, you, you really can't debunk someone's personal story. You can't do that. It's their truth. It's their, it, it's their reality. It's, you, you can't say that it's misinformation because otherwise you're kind of just saying that they don't exist. <laughs> it's like, you can't do that. So, yeah. yeah. It's for not phenomenologically true by definition. Yeah. yeah. I, th I think I, I take your point, Jessica, about quoting verbatim government data. But the point is, I think you're assuming that this is rational. Yeah, that this is reasonable. <laughs> well... <laughs> um, now, I would agree with you, but I'm another human being. I think, and of course, we don't know with Facebook or, or other platforms. I don't think a lot of it goes through a human brain. So no one is sitting there making an informed decision saying, well, you know, Jessica says that, but, you know, hey, she's just quoting CDC. Therefore, it's reasonable. I don't think that happens. I think it picks up key words, key phrases, key, yes. key concepts, of course, with artificial intelligence and, and makes yeah. decisions well, ba based wonder, on that. Yeah, no, I think you're absolutely right. It, it looks for death, for sure. Like, if you use the word death anymore, anywhere, you're, you're, you're going to get booted from wherever it is. I've noticed that. But what I'm wondering is, are the AIs and the bots um, capable now to to see the to see quote unquote the word death like D E A T H by the 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 layout of the pixels 
from from a screenshot? Like, do they actually have to pick out characters, or can they can they detect the shape of the the letters from a screenshot? Do you guys know what I mean? I, I do, and yeah. I think like, it's more. I think the answer is it's more audio recognition. Yeah, on YouTube. Audio. Sure. Yeah. Or, or, oh or, right, audio from you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, right. Or, or, yeah. or, or words in the title and words in the description. But Norman and I were discussing oh. a particular topic recently for a particular platform that we won't mention, and um, Norman said to me, "Well, that's official government data. We know that's a fact." And I said, "Yeah, it's a fact, but that's irrelevant because this is not necessarily reasonable and logical." It's not going through a reasonable brain. It's not a considered medical or legal opinion. It's just an algorithm. And, and as a result of that, Norman suffered a penalty yeah, for yeah. saying something that was, was true. And um, it's, 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 this is the frustrating thing. It's not rational. Yep, yep. I got kicked off for a week and a strike on YouTube. Anyway, get, get to the meters now. See, so your views, John, on, on the COVID narrative have changed quite dramatically from yeah. originally supporting, I guess, what you call most of the official narrative. And that included, I mean, the official narrative, for example, was opposed to the Great Barrington Declaration, which is now considered to be, you know, everybody says, well, that, that, that's kind of like sensible. And, it's, and especially the idea that the vaccines were, were safe and effective. So first of all, what, what convinced you to promote the vaccines in the first place, for example? And what was the key thing that happened that made you change your mind? Mm. You know, this whole experience to me, Norman, I think there's analogies uh, with the First World War. It was kind of the age, the end of the age of deference. When soldiers came back and thought, well, you know what, these officers are just as stupid as we are, or, or in most cases, more stupid than we are. And that's what I've been left with, just just feeling so let down, even betrayed by uh for example, my government and my government officials. So when, when you have the, the prime minister, the chief scientific officer and the chief medical officer all singing off the same hymn sheet, you think, well, I can assume that these people have got a hierarchy of brilliant people working for them. Surely what they are saying is the best possible analysis of the evidence at the time. And, and, and looking back now, I can see that it very often that wasn't the best possible analysis of the evidence at the time. And I, I just feel really completely let down by that. Um, the, the disappointment and um, the, the disillusionment that I know a lot of people feel and, and the, the, the betrayal and, and, the, and the lack of trust in authority. Um, runs pretty deep uh, in me and, and in a lot of other people. But to be more specific about your question, Norman, um, what I've always been interested in, because basically I started, I was a first year psychiatric nurse when I was 18 and I was a psychiatric nurse, a general nurse, and I taught nurses, been involved in, in health medical research around the world and teaching around the world and looking at health problems around the world. It's always been the, the health of the individual that I've been interested in. And as 2021 went on, I started doing some uh, interviews um, with um, people who'd suffered uh, vaccine injuries. And the people that I interviewed were at pretty low risk. You know, we're talking about young fit adults here that were pretty low risk. So, so to me, a medical, it started to realize just a minute, a medical intervention here should be carried out for the benefit of the individual. And that didn't seem to be getting done. So the whole risk benefit analysis seemed to change to me clearly. And, and by the end of 2021, as you'll remember, the, the Omicron was coming thick and fast. Mm. Omicron was making people way less sick. Omicron was highly transmissible. Everyone was getting it. And we'd been told overtly and covertly that, well, you need the vaccine for immunity. But then I thought, just a minute, I've been teaching the immune system for the last 30 years now. And we talk about the innate immune system and the adaptive immune system. And the adaptive immune system is the whole point of the adaptive immune system is it adapts to new potential antigens in the environment. And I knew from basic theory that the immune system could recognize up to eight or nine billion different environmental antigens. I thought, well, why should this virus be any different? 
surely surely this natural immunity is going to be there we're not dependent on the vaccine we're not dependent on the intervention now we could argue about whether vaccines were important in the early stage but this whole thing about natural immunity seemed to be ignored and the risk benefit analysis has changed so when and and i was following the the zoe symptom tracker data and, and as omicron went on the symptoms of covid became less and less the severe chest pain the severe respiratory distress more and more onto the upper respiratory features uh, as being an upper respiratory virus and then it, it, penny kind of dropped that just a minute this is just now thanks to omicron not through to anything clever that human beings did but as a result of the natural evolution if you like of this virus uh, the, the the natural change in the created order that makes viruses less pathogenic typically as time goes on i mean it happened very quickly with, with omicron that was a big favor uh, the, the 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 creator did to humanity there we, we, we benefited a lot from from omicron really quickly but that changed the risk benefit analysis but the point is the advice didn't change yeah yeah the advice stayed the same and i thought just a minute the goalposts have moved here let's it, surely the advice should be being modified now and i think that's what it was that the 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 fact that the environment had changed but the government advice was staying the same and and the mismatch became too obvious to ignore i think that's the main thing that, that changed my thinking norman okay that's because i mean many people who were challenging the the official narrative let's say right from the start and i'm talking about even you know before the before the vaccines even in 2020 challenging the narrative about the severity and you know treatments of of covid they were being heavily censored and cancelled and um despite the fact that what they were saying then is now known to be true. So the thing is, having spoken about this censorship thing, how much of an impact do you think that that kind of censorship had on the general public and yourself in, in terms of simply not having easy access to what those counter arguments were? Well, I think we need to qualify your question, if I don't mind, first, Norman. Um, you know, in 2020, people were saying a lot of different things. And now in the clear white light, that is cast by the retrospectoscope we can say you know that group of people had a flipping good point there so you know it, it's a bit self-selecting yes there are people that had good points but there are people that had bad points as well and which of which have been transpired by the ongoing development of the evidence and it's easy to look back and say you know what you know norman you seem to get it right which is true <laughs> you did seem to get it right from 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 a very early stage um but all all you can go on is is the uh, ignoring the part of, of being let down by authority which, which is there i believe all you can go on is is the best evidence that you have at the time now in, in early 2020 um some people got it right but i don't believe that that was fully evidence-based at that time we, there was a lot of unknowns and um some people took kind of a almost a philosophical position that's transpired to have been correct i mean what, what one of the reasons that that my channel did well in in early 2020 was by the end of january certainly by the beginning of february 2020 i thought just a minute let's look at the transmission characteristics of this virus and this was way back in the wuhan virus the original one uh, let's look at how quickly this is transmitted Let's look at these R numbers, which were about, what, 2.6 at that time. Let's look at the reaction of the Chinese. The Chinese know a thing or two, and yet they've done these massive lockdowns. Um, I put those things together and I thought, just a minute, this virus is going to be highly transmissible. And the World Health Organization was see still seemed perfectly happy, <laughs> separate debate, but seemed perfectly happy to let flights go in and out of China. Uh, there was no sort of uh, attempt to um, the World Health Organization to restrict this. And of course, at the time, the World Health Organization weren't using the word pandemic, but I'm pretty sure I started using the word pandemic pretty early on, early February. So I, I kind of said, look, this is going to be a pandemic here. And then within the next few weeks, that became obviously true. So, so that kind of um, that, that kind of vindicated what I was saying, and I think gave me some credibility in the okay. in those early days okay then with the benefit of, of hindsight do you feel um 
now, do you feel now that COVID was never as serious as it was claimed and that the vaccines were never as safe and effective as claimed? Right. The, 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 there's two there's two questions there. Let, let, let's, do, let's do the first one, Norman. Firstly, the severity. I, I and think also, man, I'd also like to know your views about because there's a lot of people um, talking about the, the idea that, you know, maybe a lot of the early um, COVID um, cases were just, you know, it was, it, they were just sort of, Basically, they might have been flu. Yeah. Um, so well, your views about that? In 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 in, 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 in let, let's take twenty twenty to, to be going on with. So in twenty twenty, we started with the Wuhan strain, and then there was different strains in different parts of the world. And I quite I quite I don't quite remember the exact dates, but then we had the Alpha strain in the UK, which did 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 took over from the Wuhan strain, and 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 then the Delta strain took over after that, didn't it? And then eventually we were sort of more or less rescued by the Omicron. Now, um, the the Wuhan and the Alpha and the Delta strain, when they affect people that were naive to the, to that strain, then yeah, it did it did cause um, significant illness in a significant number of people. Um, now, I um, wasn't in clinical practice at that time, but I've talked to people who were. And they um, did see people coming in, especially during the alpha wave, that were ill uh, as a result of, of, of COVID infection. Now, yes, most of those had comorbidities. Yes, there wasn't that many young fit people there. But the combination of a completely naive immune system to this type of coronavirus did, did give rise to genuine pathophysiological features. Now, was that overhyped by the government yeah i think it probably was um was the type of reporting that we got from a lot of mainstream media did, did that give a distorted view of that i think yes i think it probably did but we were dealing with a new disease a new virus a relatively naive immune system and people did get sick and and people did did die um the degree to which that is true is going to be a source of debate for a long time to come. I would certainly say that um, it was in, and and I think I think we saw this in was was this in? Remember all those tweets from the then Secretary of Health Norman that were were, were, were leaked. And I think I think one of them said it was a strategy to to frighten yeah, this, people. This is the what yeah the WhatsApp stuff. Um, yeah, the WhatsApp. The what yeah the WhatsApp yeah. yeah. So I mean, th there is I evidence think. that it was almost in some members of the government, a strategy to frighten people. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure Jessica's probably got some thoughts yeah, on yeah. the issue. Yeah, but continue. Yeah. So so I, th I, th I think I think the answer to your question, Norman, is yes, it's a genuine, there was a, there was genuine pathology there. Yes, it was misrepresented. I think I think that's probably the answer to yeah. that. Now, in in term in terms of vaccines. We were assured over and over again, quoting from politicians, that these were safe and effective. Now, the, the, sa the safety bit, of course, we now know that there's multiple adverse reactions to these vaccines. Um, and I'm not going to say more than adverse reactions because we want to make this video public domain. But some, let's just say some of those uh, adverse reactions were significant. Some of those adverse reactions were, were, were serious. And yet we were told repeatedly that the, 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 these were safe. So clearly, the, word, the way that I would use the word safe and the way that officials were using the word safe have two completely separate meanings. In terms of effectiveness, um, well, there was some evidence from the original trials that they reduced transmission for a period of time. It, it, we didn't know how short a period of time they would work for. Um, sorry, they didn't reduce transmissions. They, they, they reduced the probability of someone suffering symptomatic disease. They were never very good at reducing transmission. Uh, and it's now become obvious that respiratory viruses don't really, uh, a systemic immunization won't significantly reduce the transmission of a respiratory virus. So we've got kind of different factors there. Is it reducing transmission? Not not very much was the answer. Is it, is it stopping symptomatic disease? Well, 
for the original strain with the original vaccine to, to some degree, but, but again, much more limited than we were thought. Is it preventing serious illness? Well, in, in the early stages, there is some evidence that it did prevent some serious illness, but nothing like as much as we were uh, led to believe. So I, I just get the, the, the impression that this is going to be debated for, for an awful long time to come. Um, but it was nothing like as good as we thought it was, and there was an awful lot more adverse reactions than we thought there would be, particularly with particular types of vaccine, of course, that were subsequently limited to particular age groups and were subsequently um, subsequently withdrawn. Yeah, as we've discussed, yeah. <laughs> mm. Yeah, Jessica, did you want to um, come in on any of that? Um, well, uh, I'm, I'm one of the people that was a real early bird on this. Um, it's just uh, that, the, you know, I have a background as well that kind of g gives me a unique detection system. Um, and uh, and I know kind of what to look for uh, scientifically and also um, pathologically, I suppose, if you go outside. Like I, a lot of the things that I did in the beginning was just to go outside and observe what was happening to the people. And uh, they, yeah, exactly. They didn't align. Um, so that made me that made me look even harder at um, eventually the adverse event data, as you guys know. Um, but I, I I wasn't I anticipated the reason I started to do that was because I anticipated based on how it was presented to us as this very unidirectional solution with no side solutions. You know what I'm talking about. There's no other way out of this. We, we heard these, this as a, as a mantra, um, as, as, a, as a global population. I mean, there's no other way out of this. We need to do this every single person type mentality, which is, that's weird. That, that's, not how you, that's not how you operate in vaccinology or epidemiology, et cetera. So yeah, um, the... The technology itself, I mean, I suppose I I was able to anticipate the, the I'm, tr I'm trying to watch my words, <laughs> the growth of um, the numbers of adverse events because it wasn't difficult for me because I, I understood what the technology was based on, that there might be problems. Um, the, the introduction of a foreign uh, protein to be produced by the self is a bad idea. And, and that's why I found it so unbelievable. I'm like, the claims were that this was going to be um, a transient, pretty much innocuous experience. It was going to teach your body, the acquired branch, how to fight off the challenge. Like when you see the real pathogen um, using this um, exposure to these this one protein. And I was like, yeah, but <laughs> uh, you guys are forgetting to tell everybody about the fact that, and we know this now, um, that the the modified, I'm not sure what I'm allowed to say, the modified mRNA is very stable and has been shown in peer-reviewed literature to stick around for quite a long time, um, spike as well. And so... It seems like in some people, and this is what makes me mad about the whole thing, about the, the the silencing part and the restriction part, because we as scientists haven't been able to explore really important questions like which people, because it seems like a, su a, a subset of the population that's actually having a really hard time. Maybe it's just a delayed effect, we don't know. But which people are actually, um, and what about them? immunologically uh, is making them continuously produce this protein if they are. Which people are, are you know, um, withholding, I suppose, this modified mRNA and why and where and all these really important questions. So it's like, we still, you're so right about the fact that we're going to be asking um, and debating and all of these things for a long time in the future because, well, personally, because I think we're restricted, but like we actually don't know the effects of the biodistribution of the LNPs. We don't know the effects of um, the manufacturing of these modified mRNAs 
uh, in various organs and organ systems. We don't know which proteins are actually being manufactured according to other data. The percent RNA integrity in called, is called into question now. I mean, there are so many very serious potential consequences here, which I think the people who are in the development phase really knew about. I, I can't imagine that these aren't incredibly intelligent people. I do understand that there are, it's a bit of a telephone game. There's a lot of disconnect between, say, uh, developers and manufacturers and the people who eventually get these um, on the market. But uh, along the line, I mean, th th let's talk about production. It seems to me that it, it would have been impossible if people were doing proper um, testing, say, of a certain number of batches, and they, they claim that they are, that things like double-stranded DNA contamination would have be, been able to become an issue. And again, now we're starting to see evidence that maybe this is a big problem. So now we need to find out if there was transparency and people were allowed to do what they've always done in the past, we should just start testing vials now and figuring out, is this actually, um, can we reproduce this other guy's work? Is this a problem? What are the effects going to be? And that's the thing, it, it comes full circle. It's like, if this was ever about the public health, if this was ever about caring for humans, if this was ever about doing what's best for everybody, this stuff wouldn't be happening, in my opinion. So it's it's a really clear disconnect. I know that was a long answer. But... Okay, well, on that, 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 then that brings us me on to the next question, then, then for John, um, which is that, um, do you believe that the vaccine recipients were ever given fully informed consent? And if not, what are the implications of that? Mm, yeah, I want to answer that one, Norman. Uh, j just before I do that, I just want to re reinforce Jessica's point there on sciences to do with reproducibility. If, if, if one group of scientists get a particular result and that actually relates to the reality of the world, and that's what science is, it's an attempt to get to the reality of the world, then that should be completely reproducible uh, anywhere else and to the degree to which that's done and j j just to finish off the last point last question norman as well uh, um jessica was was mentioning that there was only one pathway taken out of this it was all about vaccination why wasn't the secretary of state talking about optimizing nutrition why wasn't he talking oh, about vitamin d and vitamin c and ju ju just to mouth off a little bit here, I was talking about vitamin D in February. I think I'm pretty sure it was February 2020. Why wasn't he talking about the possibility of repurposed drugs? Because yeah. there is a repurposed drug that saves a lot of lives. It's uh, it's it's based on steroids. It's uh, prednisolone, the steroid drugs, dexamethasone, various versions of steroid drugs that have saved a lot of lives. There's other repurposed drugs which could have been uh, considered. Why wasn't he talking about weight loss? Why wasn't he talking about blood pressure control? Why wasn't he talking about exercise? All of these things that we know. But why wasn't he? Why do you think? Why do you think they weren't? Because because they only they they only saw vaccination as 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 the only show in town. Okay. Now, of course, no no one's saying our politicians are compromised, Norman. Of course. But what, okay then, but no one's saying that. But the, why didn't they mention all these other things? No, you're you're absolutely right. But again, coming back to the vaccine, then I mean, what what was what was your? So let's get back to your question. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But it was just about whether they do you think they were given fully informed consent, and if not, what would be the implications of that? Yeah. Um, well, in retrospect, in, in in retrospect, the answer to that is clearly not. Mm -hmm. um, I was vaccinated three times. And on none of those occasions was I told about any specific risks at all. No, that just been my, my experience. I might have had particularly bad experiences. But I wasn't given any information by clinicians to allow me to make an informed choice. Now, when, when, you, when you go in for a, an operation, the surgeon has to tell you that... Um, 
And we, we had we had this because um, we, we, we were looking at one time about nurses explaining these risks because surgeons take ages to do it. And they have to explain that there's a risk of hemorrhage, there's a risk of uh, infection, there's a risk of shock, and uh, and there's a risk of death. Surgeons mm-hmm. have to say that. So if you go if you go in for a major operation, there's no guarantee. You, you get, well, any operation, there's no guarantee. It's overwhelmingly likely you're going to be okay, but there's no guarantee. So they have to give all these they have to give all these risks. And if you if signed a, co- a consent form in an hospital, that they'll, they'll they'll have these on to say you've done all this. But with, with, with the vaccines, I wasn't told about any potential adverse reactions. Okay. Did you have to sign anything? Like, did, no. do they have any version? No. Nothing. No. That's that's a really interesting um, comparison that you just did, um, because it seems to me, um, I mean, I know it's not surgery, but it is injection with a, a an as yet experimental product. So it's interesting that not only is there no nothing that you have to sign um, as per informed consent, but your story is I've heard this thousands of times where people, it doesn't matter where you go, you can go into a pharmacy or, or at your GP and th- there's no information given about potential yeah. side effects in the majority, all the cases I've heard, which which is kind of strange because even the CDC, I, if I'm not mistaken, they've changed the um, the uh, the warning label uh, on certain product uh, pertaining to myocarditis, the side effect of, uh, or the adverse event, um, in, in young kids. So it, it's, it seems to me eh, they kind of have a, a duty. Um, it, it's neglectful not to do so. I mean, what if, this is how I think, what if that person that you didn't provide information to, especially if they ask for it, does succumb to a specific adverse event? What you know what I mean? Like what? There's no recourse. There's nothing. You're you're just kind of stuck with that situation. So, yeah. I don't think many people were asking for it, Jessica, because of the prime minister and the chief medical officer and the chief scientific officer in the World Health Organization have thought it was safe and effective. So we believe. Mm. Them. Yeah. Okay. So let's move on then. So what was your John? What was your original view? of the idea of vaccine mandates, because again, that was a kind of like, almost like the standard narrative that, that, that the mandates were, you know, were needed. And, and yeah. has your view changed on that? No, I don't, I don't think I would ever uh, mandate any form of uh, medical treatment, Norman. Um, yeah. We did do a poll on this, actually, on, on my channel, you know, that on, on, on the channel, you can do a poll. Should vaccines be mandated? And I, I was careful not to give a view on that, but I think it came out well over seventy percent were against uh, vaccine uh, mandates. So, um, no, I, I, I don't think I would ever uh, have advocated uh, mandates. And when people were being mandated, um, I, in retrospect, it would have been better to advocate for them more strongly than I did. Okay, and what about? Because also, I mean. I think it's fair to say that that you were certainly, um, you know, you were, adv- I guess, were advising people that that it made sense, um, you know, to get the vaccine. I mean, how do you feel about that now, retrospectively? Yeah. Um, t- t- two things there. Um, w- w- one is I've always been very aware not to give over medical advice on the channel. So um, I don't actually... I've never actually advised, as far as I remember, I've never actually advised people mm. to have any medical procedure. Um, it's the same when I'm talking about vitamin D. Yeah, I never say, look, you should be taking so much vitamin D. What I'll say is, well, this guideline says this much vitamin D. Personally, I'm taking 8,000 units a day at the moment. Right? Not now because it's sunny. But, you know, you know I- I'll say what I'm taking. Um, so don't actually advise people to take to take medications or indeed to to do anything because you know people always have to go through their own health care provider because i don't know the individuals having said that what did i overemphasize the official narrative of safe and effective Uh, was i insufficiently critical of that narrative looking back yes i was insufficiently critical of that narrative 
Okay, so and as a result of that, I think you've come under attack from both sides of the COVID. Well, everyone attacks me, Norman. <laughs> so, so initially, initially, the skeptics were unhappy that you seem to be you know, kind of like towing the official government line, and then you've come under attack from um, people who uh, so though they were kind of like unhappy that you, yeah, you've come under attack from people who are. Uh, let's say on the sceptical side of the argument, who kind of like suggests that the change of direction means that you're some kind of controlled opposition uh, who's being kind of like handsomely rewarded financially. So yeah, um, they, like people have been publishing your company accounts and stuff. I mean, what's your response to that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I, I, I started a company because if not, if not, you just get get completely clobbered for tax. But my accountant does all that, so I don't really understand that very much at all. But but the the key thing is is to follow the that's why i put these posts up here follow the evidence now uh that one there i don't know if you can see it but that says wherever it leads so the evidence has, has often taken me to diametrically different opinions about things you know but for year for years um we, we taught um breastfeeding mothers and pregnant mothers not to eat peanuts for years we taught diabetics should have a low fat high carbohydrate diet and, and and these things are now completely completely reversed the idea of telling a diabetic now to have a high carbohydrate low fat diet is unthinkable and yet this is what we did we, we followed the the official guidelines and uh, in, in retrospect th these were often wrong okay that's interesting okay i was i was going to ask you i mean the of course, I mean so the thing is, since you've started challenging the official narrative, yeah, that's when you've had your videos taken down and had your sort of temporary suspension. As a matter of fact, did you ever have any of that problem before? Um, um, I, I had a, a video taken down very early in 2020, um, talking to a particular doctor about a particular intervention. Right. So, so, so that did happen reasonably early um as well okay, as that that's uh, interesting because that was again so that would have been considered that you were you were uh, even then you you were starting to sort of kind of like challenge the official government narrative and that's why they were even then i don't i don't, don't think it was challenging the narrative it was just being open to evidence norman right this particular doctor was giving me evidence about a particular intervention okay and i thought hey that makes sense but no, that 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 didn't pass the uh, the official uh, bar of qualification, and and even now I still can't talk about that particular doctor or that particular intervention. So okay. so yeah, there was difficulties earlier on, uh, and right at the start of the COVID pandemic, um, um, any anything that didn't come directly from the WHO or the government was not exactly censored. But I mean, for example, YouTube videos were routinely demonetized if they talked about COVID. Yeah, because you get this um, notice that if it, it will actually say that that um, the reason for this is that it uh, it, it doesn't uh, satisfy the the views of the World Health Organization, it's it's inconsistent. I think they say with the views. Yeah, well, something like that, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but it, as you say, and Jessica said, even if you are quoting uh, verbatim data from official sources, sometimes you still can't um be, be as open in discussion as you would like to be so it would it would be better if we're in a situation where we could be completely oh, almost think out loud yeah okay again so you've made it i mean you have made it clear many times that you've always been a very strong supporter of vaccinations generally i'm not talking about the covid vaccines but the va vaccinations generally so i'm just interested to know whether what you've learned about the pharma industry and its influence over yeah. the medical institutions and media over the uh you know the covid vaccinations has that caused you in any way to reevaluate your beliefs about other vaccines or, or do you think that the covid kind of like debacle was a one-off mm. i think i think i think you've asked two questions there norman the, the, the first one is about the pharmaceutical industry and the second one is about vaccination so to take your first point first of all um, am I more cynical about the pharmaceutical industry? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, it, it just seems that so many new medications these days, you've got to take one pill a day for the rest of your life. What I'd like to do is take one pill and be cured. 
Yeah. You know, is there a financial interest to manage disease rather than cure disease? I mean, I mean, the classic example of this was Barry Marshall back in about, what, 1990, you might remember, with the Helicobacter pylori, where, where basically, instead of taking medicines every day to reduce stomach acid, he could cure it by eradicating the Helicobacter pylori. No, we, 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 want, we want more of this. We want more curative treatments. And if that means that we uh, don't buy a pill every day from the pharmaceutical industry for the rest of our life, then personally, I'm quite happy with that. So is there this vested interest? Is there the the research that gets done? Is the research that is likely to have a financial return? Well, that's not what I want. I want the research that gets done to be able to make me healthier. Yeah. Make you healthier. Make everyone healthier. This is why you spend your life in healthcare, <laughs> you know, to try and help uh, individuals. The, the, the second part of your question on, on vaccination. So... Yes, there's obviously massively serious question marks on the current round of vaccinations. Now, um, I think part of the issue was that we've I've given vaccines all my life and taught vaccination all my life. Um, and this came along and it was called a vaccine. Um, but really, when you think about it, a vaccine is giving a particular amount of antigen. So which is basically mushed up dead virus attenuated virus that's what we're doing th th these vaccines as jessica said are, are different they cause the body to produce l l at least the the oxford astrazeneca vaccine the adenovirus vector vaccine the moderna pfizer mrna vaccine stimulate the body to produce the antigen and i still don't understand how given a particular amount of if you like instruction for a, an antigen how that results in a controlled dose of antigen being produced. I would have thought that could be very different in different people. So I, I think I think the use of the word vaccine sort of um, puts some of us to sleep, if you like, because we've been given vaccines for for a long time. Now, the, the, the question you've just asked there, Norman, is to, to answer that question, I would have to evaluate <laughs> the fundamental evidence from millions of doses of vaccines. And to tell you the truth, I haven't had time to do that, and I'm not sure I've got the capacity to do that. What we have to do in healthcare is if you want to be a health professional healthcare provider, basically you, you've got to follow a lot of official guidelines and you've got to follow what, what it tells you to do in the nice guidelines. Um, is, is, is there question marks over other vaccines about risk benefit analysis? Yeah, there is. Um, current flu vaccination, for example, isn't that efficacious and actually doesn't last for for, for very long. I remember the great uh, Anthony Fauci himself saying that uh, he tends to have his flu vaccine late in the year because if you have it in September, it's kind of worn off by you know, February, February, March. Um, so is there a lot of qualifications? Uh, yeah, yeah, there is. Um, but, um, but, but based on my current understanding, it still looks to me like vaccines have saved uh, an awful lot of human pain and suffering generally. Um, some vaccines, um, so polio vaccine, for example, you know, I've worked with people with polio and it's a horrible, debilitating disease or the after effects of polio. And, uh, you know, there's no question we are seeing much less of it now. Is there complications with live polio vaccine? Does that cause a certain cause? Does that cause some polio form illness? Yeah, yeah it's not it's not a simple answer. But the principle of vaccination, where you're stimulating the immune system in an appropriate way, um, still has, I still see that as having pathophysiological uh, validity as a medical principle. Um, are the individual vaccinations open to risk benefit analysis yes of course they are okay it, it, kind of like in a similar vein there a lot of people who bought into the official covid narrative right and then later realized the extent to which they'd been misled by the government and the mainstream media i think for the first time such people have started to question the official narratives yeah. on other things such as climate change maybe even ukraine so i'm just wondering has your experience also made you question other narratives and if so which ones well <clears throat> yes in that i certainly don't trust um 
uh, government uh, edicts handed down from on high, <laughs> anything like as much as, as I did. Um, one of the really dangerous things to me that's come out of the pandemic is because of the way that people have been misled. It's, do, it's produced such a lot of cynicism. But I still believe in science. Science is an empirical study to illuminate the nature of physical reality. And if that's well done and it's properly done, that's still good. Now, we know that vested interests can pay for particular pieces of science to be done and we only get a particular narrative. We know there's all sorts of problems. But, you know, if, if, if we leave the principle of science as being a valid modality of investigation, of a, a, a way to understand the world and understand ourselves and improve our health, that, then that is a problem. So doubting science, I think, is, is, a, is a problem. Uh, in terms of those other particular examples that you mentioned, uh, I think they're both way above my pay grade, Norman. Okay, okay. Um, well, it certainly changed my views. That's yeah, yeah. that's for sure. It, it, are, are people cynical and distrusting now? Way more so. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So, who have been um, the biggest influences on you during the COVID years? Yeah, that's a good question, isn't it? Um, well. Some people that whose narrative we might question now have been big influences because um, th th they've led to cynicism and, you know, the obvious need for greater levels of of uh, analysis. But there's been other people who've um, who've worked through it. So um, some of my former students, for example, that I'm I'm still in touch with, who've, who've wor worked through the pandemic and, and the difficulties still working through the tremendous difficulties in the health service that this whole uh bizarre reaction really to to covid is generated there are a lot of the unsung un heroes and people like people like uh the people at my local supermarket you know that they, they, they've worked through all this through all the difficulty when there was unknowns okay the, the risk transpired not to be as great as as we'd feared but when there was unknowns no, they, they carried on working through this. So there's been some pretty wonderful examples of humanity have, have shone through this. Uh, I'm, I'm painfully aware I haven't named any individuals. That's OK. OK, well, not, we can name some now. Who, who would you most like to meet or interview who you haven't already had on your channel? Oh, every YouTuber wants to talk to Joe Rogan, Norman. Yeah, I'm surprised he hasn't had you on. <laughs> I'm, I'm not particularly surprised now. <laughs> Any other? Um, no, who, 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 you know, seriously, um, one of the great things that's come out of this is I've been able to talk to some really good uh, people around the world. So I'm able to talk to a leading professor of statistics, for example. Uh, I've been talking to several, uh, what, what you might call ordinary doctors, but what I would call really great doctors. You, you know, you know. So, so uh, you know, I've done some work with Michael Cohen, who, who, um, in Israel, I see him as a great, as a great doctor. He's, 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 I want him as my doctor. I wish I could have him as my doctor, or uh, you know, a Seymour Hotro, who, who's clearly, you know, examined a lot of the, uh, the the data in great detail, or another guy I'd really like to have my as my doctor, Sunil Dan. Um, and you know, the fact that you know these guys come on and talk to me, or, or, or of course. Um, uh, you know, I've talked to other people that we can't really mention whose name, names would uh, n names would flag up. But, uh, you know, I've talked to people like Professor Robert Clancy uh, regularly. Yeah. We've done a whole series on the history of um, the development of immunity through his career. You know, one of the leading, well, basically started the field of immunology in Australia. And the fact that guys of this caliber want to talk to me, <laughs> it's just, I find it just incredible. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 uh, and, and humbling so right, okay. you know, there's a lot of really good people out there all right i'm conscious of times so i'm going to finish with uh, the last question uh, which is what do you envision what do you envision as the main problems and threats currently to the health of the nation and, and what if anything do you think most needs change yeah um th there's the, the the whole problem about the sanctity of human life when does human life begin when does human life end under what circumstances should it begin? Under what circumstances should it end? 
th th these are just huge problems that very often simply aren't addressed. Mm. You know, we, we sometimes get so bogged down in the detail that we kind of miss the fact that we're right in the middle of this huge forest of lack of respect for human life. That human life is really something unique and, and pretty special and, and each, each individual needs to be respected as an individual. But of course, we've got huge problems. We've got um, big food, highly processed food. We've got big pharma. You know, we've got these multinational agencies giving us things that make profits rather than helping helping ourselves. We've got massive vested interests, whether that's corporate vested interests or particular individuals who have a little more sway than we would like individuals to have. People that are often unqualified, uh, poking their noses into uh, other fields where uh, perhaps it would be best to leave to people with more experience. The, the whole the whole commercialization of health, um, yeah. the whole commoditization of humanity. So I, th I think they're they're the ones. That, so it's the dignity of human life and the commoditization of humanity. And 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 let's look at these fundamental issues about when life begins and how life should begin and when it should end. Yeah, yeah, great points. Um, so I don't know if uh, Jessica wants to make any sort of final, give any final question or, or comment. Yeah, I, I just want to resonate with that. Uh, I'm going to be giving a presentation soon at a conference, and that's actually basically the subject matter. Um, little 180 from from data onto the 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 unbelievable importance of maintaining sovereignty not just of nation, but of self. I mean, that if there, were, if there had been any respect for any of any notion of sovereignty, of being, of nation, um, none of this would have happened. None of this would have played out the way that it did. And I've heard many really smart people say exactly the same thing, which is a true thing in my eyes. Um, if, if we maintain our individuality, which of course we should, because we can't really exert our creative beingness without doing that, um, we're, we're gonna lose uh, a lot of wonderful um, uh, creations and opportunities. Like say, say we hadn't all been told to be in lockstep the way that we were and say that uh, repurposed drugs weren't allowed in this context and say that the, the independent scientists um, from countries all over the world were just told do your thing. If doctors were not like handcuffed and said, do your thing, be a doctor, care for your patients, there wouldn't have been a problem. Not not even for a week, in my opinion. We we would have had, we're, we're brilliant and we're even more brilliant when we get together and merge our ideas. And we would have had solutions out the yin yang, like in my opinion. And we need to maintain sovereignty of being a nation. and that And that's like, very relevant in these times where um, we're seeing IHR amendments from the WHO coming that don't look like they're going to benefit sovereignty of anything. <laughs> so that's my final thought. Having okay. missed that. yeah, I'll just resonate with that, Norman. Yeah. Actually, um, the, the threat from international organisations and the fact that international organisations now are trying to use the power of the nation state to enforce their international collective will on individuals. So I get lots of people saying, look, um, whatever new regulation we're talking about, well, I'm not going to do that. Well, you flipping well are if the nation state, if the nation, if the, na if, if the power of the state is behind it, you are. Yep. Um, yeah, it's really and, uh, yep. You know, the, 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 the last plea is, you know, let, let's protect people that are weaker than ourselves because we all have weak, vulnerable periods in our lives. Can't protect weak people, then what's it for? That's exactly. Yep. That's a line in my presentation. <laughs> A great note to finish on. I really want to thank both uh, John and Jessica for for being here today. And um, yeah, I look forward to the reaction to people to this uh, these great interviews. Thanks very much. Thanks, Norman. Thanks, Jessica. Thanks.